Hi, everybody. For those who don't know me, I'm Steve Fenske, one of the MAT attorneys. And uh, our presentation today is going to be about uh, injuries, uh, not so much just so you know about them, uh, what people can have happened to them that the town would need to pay for, but more, more so, how do you prevent them from happening? And hopefully, we uh, end up not having any of these issues in the first place. Okay. Um, I am going to try running a presentation here. And I'll try to share my screen. I've done this with mixed results here uh, recently. Um, oh, I gotta go back one. Now. One more. And it's still not even noon. So if there's people who are going to be joining the call, um, they might still be logging on. Tom, um, in answer to your question, towns do not have to provide CPR or any kind of first aid classes. All right, Kristen, can you see the presentation? Yep. You can. Okay, excellent. So we will let me know if anything uh, doesn't work here on the presentation. Okay. All right. And we are at noon. As Kristen mentioned, we started earlier a moment ago. So we'll start over. Um, my name is Steve Fenske. I'm one of the MAT attorneys. And today we're going to be talking about personal injury claims. Uh, not so much just so you know about these, but uh, talk about how to maybe avoid them because some of these things can be avoided pretty easily. And we should be trying to avoid them easily. Uh, they're low cost. They don't take a lot of a lot of time and effort sometimes to address this stuff. Uh, sometimes it's going to be similar to what you do with your roads. You probably have a process already kind of conditioned and ingrained in the board of how you're going to deal with road issues and how you're going to pay attention to them. Uh, but you probably own some other properties too. And we're going to look at, at what we do with some of that. Okay. Uh, there's two broad types that we're going to talk about. The, the first are intentional injuries. Um, they're, they're sometimes called torts, but we're, I'm not trying not to use that word, but it just means personal injury. You, you've harmed someone. Uh, intentional means you had to mean to do it. Okay, not hard here. This is not a reach. And I'll go into to detail about a, a couple of those types here in a moment. But the other broad type is the type that we see most often, and we're gonna spend a fair amount of our time on. Uh, it's, it's negligence. This is the area where, um, as we operate the Township Insurance Trust and we see all these claims that come up, most of these things are negligence. Of course, we get some other things, okay? But a lot of them are just simple negligence matters. And we'll go into what that means. And here we have a lot of opportunities, I think, to make things a little bit better, a little bit safer, uh, avoid some problems for you, okay? Uh, and I'm pointing out here, Kristen did put the handouts into the chat again. And what you're gonna have is a handout that has this slide presentation. So if you're having issues with the slide presentation, um, you could certainly use the printout. It's an outline form. So it's pretty much the same as what I'm going to have on the screen. And then you also have a checklist. The checklist, I'm not going to go into so much today. This is something that uh, as we look at how to, to manage risk, I tried to put together things that you could think about and things that you could look at. And so I'm not going to be referring back to it. It's kind of the, this is the, the end result of this discussion today. The end result should be, we need a process to look at these things in the checklist. Okay. But you want to know well, what could happen. So you have an idea of why these are on here and what you're going to look for. Right. Um, when you get these kind of, kind of problems, uh, it used to be that the governments were exempt from these kind of claims. It was sovereign immunity. The, the king could do no wrong. Right. Um, and that carried over into, into us government. Okay, for a long time, but we don't have that anymore. Now the baseline rule is that governments are liable for their harms just as anybody else would be. Okay, and it's civil liability, not criminal. So no one's going to jail with any of this stuff. That's not what we're talking about. Okay, or they're not going to jail because of the personal injury side of it, right? Uh, it means when there's a problem, we typically compensate people with money. 
uh, that's going to be how these are resolved, right? Important to know, town officers are not personally liable for civil wrongs of the township. So when you're acting as a board member and you're acting within your authority, you're not there as an individual, right? Uh, because who would take this job if you were liable for the, the wrongs of the township? You would never want to do that. Nobody would ever want to do that. So when you talk about these, um, it should be that the town gets sued if there's a problem. Occasionally, an individual supervisor's name shows up, but that doesn't mean you're going to have to pay something, okay? So keep that in mind as we look through this. This is an opportunity to make things safer and better, not have claims against you in the first place. All good. But, but this is not a place where we're thinking, oh, you got to do this or you're going to have to get out your checkbook. Okay, that's not the, the point here. The point is to make these places better for the community that you serve. All right. Um, I'm not going to, to talk about several things and I'm going to exclude them right now. We are not talking about employment law because employment law is a whole other box of, of issues. And it's because you owe special uh, different duties to employees that you don't owe to people in the public. Workers' compensation is similar, but it's its own branch of personal injury law. It's very procedural and it doesn't always matter uh, who's at fault. It's a person is on the job and therefore there are certain consequences when they're injured. So we are not talking about those issues, nor are we gonna talk about statutory claims, all right? When I talk about personal injury up at the top, we said intentional injuries or negligence. These are what are called common law, meaning judge-made law. They're not in a statute anywhere. But over time, some statutes have been created to address particular types of negligence or intentional injury. Uh, for example, uh, trees in the right of way. You guys can take trees in the right of way because of a statute. You can go to that statute and look at how you do it. And here's a process and it gives you the penalty if you do something wrong. Okay. Now, before that statute was created, we could have fit that kind of injury into one of these personal injury matters. But because the legislature created a claim for it in statute, it's its own thing now. And we're going to exclude it because we can go and look at what, it, what exactly that means. Okay. And there's others like that. Uh, it's important to know there's nothing new in this area of law, really. I mean, there's, there's areas where we talk about things being new and uh, personal injury attorneys uh, talk about this and legislators talk about it. There's, there's developments at the Capitol and things like this. But overall, this stuff has been around forever. And we can, we can look back into ancient texts pretty much as far back as we can find and, and see there are issues with um, personal injury and I, I tried to summarize it this way. No matter which culture we look at, there's a common belief that people owe a duty to each other and we could be held accountable for failing in the duty. It's a reflection of what we think is required for all people, no matter what you think of them. And that differs over time, okay? That differs over uh, station in life and, and class and money. And, and we can go back as far as Code of Hammurabi. This is just kind of interesting that, look, some of the things we deal with are in the, or you can go back to this, okay? And the Code of Hammurabi wasn't new either. That was codifying laws that had been verbal in the societies before uh, Persian Sumerian culture, okay? So here's just some examples uh, of what you'll find in the Code of Hammurabi. Personal injuries resulting in loss of a body part. This is the, the one we're most familiar with because it's in, in common speech, eye for an eye justice is, is what we talk about. But it was only applied when, when people were of equal status. But if you were of higher class or status, then you just had to pay money again. There's this history of paying money. Okay, assault of a superior, 60 blows with an ox whip. This is what we would now call cruel and unusual. We don't do this kind of thing, okay? Um, I found this next one interesting. If you assault an equal, you would say, and the code has this, it's like quoted, I did not injure him wittingly and then pay the medical expenses and all is apparently fine in the legal world of, of uh, of Persia. So uh, it's a, a different time, a very different idea of justice. And the last one I'll point out here, medical malpractice. They had a very different idea. If uh, a surgeon made a mistake, they would cut off his hand. Again, this is really a different way of seeing things. But the point being, we've always had this idea that we owe duties to each other. Okay. Intentional injuries. I've listed several here and one is highlighted. All right. And one is highlighted because that's the one that if you have an intentional tort, an intentional injury, this is the one that tends to happen in the course of normal uh, township business where you're not doing something uh, you know, horribly wrong, okay? So assault is um, not actually hitting anyone. Assault is you're putting someone in fear of being struck, 
this is a different thing than, than what we think of as assault in law and criminal law where you hurt somebody. Okay, battery is what uh, is where you actually hit someone and harm them, all right? Um, conversion is just civil theft. We don't usually see these in town law and that's good. It means you're keeping your hands to yourself. You're not stealing things, okay? Emotional distress, likewise, not a lot of that, nor fraud. Uh, nuisance we see sometimes on a large scale, uh, public nuisance, like when you're looking at uh, cleaning up blight properties and stuff like that, but that's now been more put into a statute. There's, there's nuisance statutes, okay? Defamation is one we are gonna talk about a little bit more. We're gonna get to that in the next slide. But I wanna point out what do we mean by intent here because it's critical to, to know what it means. So we'll do this with, with an example. Say you, you see a friend, uh, you haven't seen this person in a very long time. This is not hard to imagine in this past year, right? You see this person and you go to hug them, you slap them on the back, maybe a little hard because you know you haven't seen them in a long time. Um, you're working out a lot because you have extra time staying in your house, whatever the reason, and you injure this person, right? You, you hit them and maybe they had a condition that gets worse or maybe you just hit them so hard that it does harm them. Well, the law would look at this and say, look, you didn't intend the result. You didn't try to harm them. This was, this was true accident. Maybe it's negligence. Maybe we could talk about that but it's not an intentional battery here. This is not something where they could they could say it's battery against you. And I realize that this good friend, they're probably not gonna sue you in the first place, um, but it illustrates the point that uh, of what intent means, okay? There's examples in in uh, some of the laws that, that talk about what these things are, okay? And the next one is uh, a person places a bomb in an office. And this is trying to get the, the idea of, well, you're trying to harm one person, but you probably know there are other people there. And if you harm all of them, that's deemed to be you intended because you should have known that that was the likely outcome. So there's some expectation or, or some idea of what do you expect to happen? And that's going to, going to be important, okay? Um, we can think of other examples. And that's why I've just left a couple spots here. It's, it's where you just kind of think about, well, what is this? What does this mean? So if we wanted to fill in one, okay? It could be, I go into Menards because I need a couple things. And I, one of them is a, a, a 30 cent washer. Okay, and I don't have a cart and I put that washer in my, my breast pocket here and I buy my other stuff, but I forget to, to take this washer out. It's 30 cents. I didn't intend to steal 30 cents, okay? But I'm caught. Now, uh, yeah, they could use theft, right? There's a, a criminal theft or they could, they could use civil conversion, okay? Civil theft. Well, I didn't intend to, to walk out and not pay for it. I did, but it was a mistake, okay? It, it means mistake can be part of what what takes away intent in these things, okay? You have to mean the harm or reasonably expect the harm. All right, so on to defamation. I'm gonna go through what are called elements on some of these things, not because they're really important for you to learn or know, all right? It's not like you have to memorize these. This is just so you know, here's what this thing is, because we're gonna do an example using these, these sections here, okay? So defamation is what people commonly refer to as slander or libel. It's uh, demeaning them in some way, all right? Uh, in print or verbally. There's a, a lot of ways to do that. So here's our, our elements, and then we're gonna go to the example and apply these things, all right? So first, the defendant, the alleged bad guy, made a false and defamatory statement about the plaintiff, okay? So it has to be false. That's the first question, is it true or false? And then they're also gonna look at, well, okay, whether it was true or false, is this really an allegation of fact? because that matters. Uh, certain things you say could be opinion, they would not be defamatory, right? Uh, when a public official is the declarant, this is you, this is a town officer, you are a public official. The statement must be made with malice. This is interesting because there's a special exception in, in this common law for government officials. It, it kind of says, it's harder for you to defame someone as a public official than it would be for somebody else, okay? Anybody else in the public who, who says or writes something that's, you know, meets these other three criteria, they are subject to defamation claim. But you as a public official, just because you're a public official, you have more latitude here, right? Don't go running away saying things that you shouldn't be saying, but it's a little bit comforting to know you have a little bit more latitude when you're dealing with public issues. So, so within your public sphere, okay? Don't go using this everywhere or something. Uh, malice means you, you do it, uh, you know that the statement is false or you didn't care if it was false or true and you just said it anyway, all right? Three statement is unprivileged publication. Well, there's a bunch of uh, 
elements here. Okay, unprivileged. This tells you there's reasons why something might be okay. You'll have a privilege to say things that maybe otherwise you couldn't. All right. Um, and I'm not talking attorney client privilege, although that could fit within this. There's other privileges you'll have, and we'll see it in the example. All right. Publication here just means saying or writing, putting into a form that somebody else, a third party, is able to receive. Okay. That's all that means. And uh, four, it has to harm them. There has to be a, an injury or a harm to that person's reputation. And that's often something easier to see because there's something that'll happen and you know that, oh, this thing happened to them, okay? So here's our example. I'll, I'll do the facts and then we'll talk about the elements a little bit. And we may change things a little bit too as we will go through. Uh, this is a real example, right? This is a real case. It was a uh, city of Buffalo case, okay? Not far from, from where we are now. Several firefighters write a letter to their chief asking the captain, who's one of them, one of uh, three assistant captains, be removed. The letter includes statements that he has a bad attitude. He is rude to others. He doesn't follow safety protocols. He has no personnel skills, lacks leadership and responsibility at fire or rescue scenes and no respect. I have the, the image of Rodney Dangerfield here. No respect, he has no respect, right? Uh, now, this is their letter. They pass along saying, hey, look, we don't, we don't trust that this guy should be in leadership, effectively is what it's saying, okay? It says some other things too, and I, I'll, we'll get to those in the bottom here. Um, the chief passes this along to the town board, let's say, the assistant fire chiefs, and a fire department advisory board. Now, the fire chiefs and the advisory board don't have a role in employment. Okay, uh, the captain is then removed from his office. He gets to, to remain on saying that he's some kind of management. He's not in his office, but he's management. And that way he can still get up the trainings that he would usually have if he were uh, a captain, okay? But he's, he feels he's defamed by this and he brings lawsuit against the city here or town, okay? And the assistant uh, 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 chiefs, the, the captain, all, of, all the people involved, okay? Is the town liable? This is going to be the question, right? Um, I'm going to start with the answer, but we're going to go through how we get there, okay? No, they're not going to be liable in this. But there's so many statements and there's so many things going on that it gets really tricky to look at, okay? So we we would go back to our uh, our our previous slide here. Okay, now we apply our our elements. Okay, did the defendants? Uh, did they make a false and defamatory statement? So that's our starting point here. And the court has to figure out, well, what are the, what they call actionable, meaning their opinion or their uh, statements of fact, okay? Because opinions, we can't tell the truth or falsity of. They're just purely, a, a, there's no objective basis. They're just pure opinion. And, and they separate these, okay? So actionable allegation means, yeah, this statement is one that we can look at. Okay, we can show, is it true or false? Did he follow safety procedures? We can look at whether he followed them because there's a rule. Did you follow the rule or not? Um, two, we can find out, did any firefighters feel that they wouldn't follow him into a burning structure, all right? So this, the court says, all right, these, are, these could survive. These can go on as part of a defamation claim, but some of these are not. He was rude. He thought himself better than others. No respect, right? These are just opinion because uh, sir, sure, people can have an opinion about whether they have respect about a person, but there's not much in the world that is more subjective than do you respect a person or not, because that's personal. You, you're, you, you have your personal baseline for that, and it's not something we can compare to, to something, okay? Next question, are they false? Well, maybe that's, that's a possibility, okay? They're not obviously false. They're not uh, wild claims that couldn't possibly be true. We're going to say, yeah, they... they could be false and the court has to look further into that, okay? Second, and this is because it's a government, right? Only because of it's, it's a government. Did the defendant make these statements? And remember the statements was, the, was in the letter passed on, okay? So you're the fire chief and you just pass on a letter. That's the statement, okay? And, and you had it. And, and so you can be fit into this box of you made the statement or the town made the statement. Now, in this case, the court said there was no malice, that the people who wrote the letter, they didn't seem to think that they were false. They really believed them to be true. And they didn't look like they were being reckless. They didn't, it's not like they said they didn't care about the truth or the falsity. They weren't avoiding it. So 
here's where we could stop. We could stop right now and say, no malice, okay? And if you don't have this element, the rest of the claim is done. We don't have to look at it, all right? This kind of thing does come up for towns. And you may be thinking, wow, that's a, that's a lot of discussion about this issue and we never have this issue, that's not us. Look, you all talk, okay? There's disagreements inevitably you could potentially have this issue, okay? So that's where you have to be cautious, right? Now, if they did find malice, just to illustrate privilege, here there is a privilege for the town board because the town board is the employer, right? So the chief, his job would have been to give it to the town board so that they can decide, well, as the employer, are we gonna take an action on this or not? That's what's deemed privilege because that's the right group of people to see it. But it wouldn't have been privileged when it went to the uh, assistant chiefs or the other captains or the advisory board, because they have no role in employment. It's not their business to address this issue. Okay. Um, they had this employment claim; they had to address it. Um, and third parties easy to show. Okay, did it did it leave the the person who said it and the person who it's about? And if it left that, then yeah, we can say it was published. Okay, and that's, we mentioned it went to the, the chiefs, the assistant chiefs and the uh, uh, board as the administrator, okay. And was there harm? Harm is easy to show. Yeah, he was removed from his position. He, he suffered damage to his reputation based on it. So you now in the end, this one was a no, right? But had facts changed just slightly, yeah, they, they could have said something that was truly false, that could be proven as false. And, and it could be something that they didn't look into it all. They just repeated. That tends to be reckless. That might be malice, right? And now you have a bigger problem. So uh, another, another town example we had, uh, this is a, another real one. It was a dispute over a contract, uh, a bill and a contract. And a supervisor believed that they were being overcharged and they were having a back and forth with the vendor in a meeting. And it, it turned out that the supervisor said some things that weren't true but the supervisor believed them to be true based on looking at another report, okay? She was wrong, but she didn't have malice. And she was dealing with a bill in the course of a, of a public meeting, which is the place where they have to deal with it by the open meeting law. So for a couple of reasons, we could take you know, that set of facts and say, well, was it false? Yeah, it was false. It wasn't opinion. We could prove whether they billed correctly or not, okay? Was it malice? Uh, no, in this case, it wasn't. She wasn't trying to, to say something that was not true. And privileged, yeah, it had to be addressed in that place. Okay, they had to have that discussion there. Um, this is one where it has come up and it could come up for your township. Okay, how do we avoid this? It's, just, uh, it's a little easier than some of the other issues. Uh, be careful about what you say. Obviously, be careful about what you say. Okay. Don't say it unless you know it to be true or you're asking a real question, not a leading question or innuendo or one that's said to paint a picture like, well, we've had problems with contractors in the past. Well, that may be true, but if you're saying it to this particular contractor that you've never had the issue with, what you're really saying is, I don't trust you because I've had trouble trusting other people. And that's not going to add up. Right, so you, you do have to be careful. And if you're the type that you're not, you, you may know you get in trouble for things you say, it may be uh, where you let one of the other board members do some of the talking, okay? And I know that's hard for some folks. They really wanna be engaged and, and, and feel that their directness is the best way. But when you know this is potentially going to happen or you're potentially gonna say something incorrect and could face this issue, give pause, give time, take your time, okay? That's always a good thing to do, all right. We are going to move on to negligence because, as I mentioned, uh, that's a bigger piece of what townships do and what townships uh, manage. And I want to add, a, a, when we go back to defamation on the checklist, there's not something you're going to find there, okay, on that checklist. On that checklist deals more with this part here, okay, into negligence. Again, we have the elements. I'm sorry for the boring part of learning the, the elements. We're going to apply them, hopefully, in more interesting ways. The idea of negligence, you have a duty to do something or not do something and you fail in that duty, okay? So it's an oversight or careless act. It's a classic accident. Whenever we say it was an accident, we're probably talking about some kind of negligence here. We have four elements, pretty brief. You have a duty. You're supposed to do something or not do something. Two, you have failed in that duty. You do it or you don't do it. 
Okay, whatever you did, you did it wrong. Uh, three is causation. Now there's two types of causation that we look at. One is legal causation, and that's the one we care about. Are you legally the cause for the thing that happened? That's different than what's called the actual cause. And one of the classic examples is uh, the Great Chicago Fire. Uh, I think it's uh, Mrs. Mrs. O'Leary. She sets out a lantern and a cow kicks the lantern and well, it starts a fire and then it catches onto the next building and the next building. And before you know it, half of Chicago is burned down. Well, is Mrs. O'Leary at fault? We could say the actual cause was her, right? But in a legal sense, we would say, well, no, she's not the legal cause for everything that happened. Maybe she's the legal cause for her building. Maybe she's the legal cause for her building in the next building. And this is where we get into more discussion about how far does it go? Who's the real cause? And this is where some of these court cases end up of who's the cause, what's the cause? And we try to apportion that. Are they uh, in, a, in a case where two people did something wrong? Who has more of the, the, the causation at, at risk here, okay? So point being, it's not always obvious and it's up for dispute and, and debate, you don't necessarily have to have that debate, okay? But you have to know that it's there. Last, again, easier to see is, is damages. Are, is there some loss or damage? Uh, it usually means, well, part of the car is broken. Yeah, there's damage. Somebody has an injury, they needed surgery. Yep, and there's damage, okay? Uh, in that case, we, we, we usually can show that pretty, pretty simply, okay? So we're gonna do some examples that we commonly see. We get these every year, slip and falls. Every single year we get slip and fall claims. So here's our example. Mother is walking to community center for a basketball tournament. And if you say, well, we don't have a community center, this is gonna to apply to us. No, it's not about the community center, okay? You could make this a town hall. She's walking into the town hall, all right? That's just fine. Uh, she slips on black ice on the sidewalk, injuring her ankle. She thought it was a sprain. She attends the tournament, but later she found out uh, the ankle is broken and it injured her knee. She needs two surgeries to repair this damage. The community center staff treats the sidewalk with salt each day. They shovel it. Uh, they do all that stuff. And they did that this day. Okay. Is the town liable? So we're going to look at what's the answer and what could they have done, if anything? Could they have done anything? All right. The answers I'll, I'll come back to here. You can see them, but, but I'll come back to them, okay? So the first thing is, well, is there a duty for, um, for let's say a township to keep the sidewalks and walking areas clear of snow? And yes, there is. We've looked at that and, and, and uh, court cases look at that and they say, okay, if you're gonna, you're gonna make this man-made structure, which is the sidewalk, which may be the parking lot, and you're gonna have it there for people to use, you have some duty if you know they're going to be there or expect them to be there to clear that area of uh, what they call reasonable risks okay or likely harms so that's the duty and in this case right so that's clear here there was a duty all right the second element is did they breach it did they fail in their duty and this is the spot where we're gonna say no they probably didn't breach their duty Okay, and it's because of a rule that uh, Minnesota has, because Minnesota is, is a place with so much snow and ice. These claims come up over and over and over, right, because of our climate, and courts look at them and say, it's not reasonable. In, in no world could we say it's fair and reasonable to think that uh, landowners could clear all areas of ice and snow accumulations, and they call it the mere slipperiness rule. If the only reason a person slips and harms himself, okay, is because just the surface is slippery, that alone does not make the landowner here, the township liable, okay? But we could change that a little bit. What if she slipped uh, on a patch of ice that was there because there's a downspout? So there's a downspout from the building. She's walking on the sidewalk next to the building and it's a buildup of, of ice because of this downspout. Maybe there was some thawing as we get into the spring and it's refreezing, right? And it's ridged, okay? Well, that condition we can see. And, and here the court looks at that and says, well, that's not mere slipperiness. That is a condition that was created because of where the downspout was placed. And you knew that it would run water down. You knew that in addition to changing you know, temperatures here, you're gonna have an accumulation of ice there. So you needed to do something to remove it. 
All right, so little changes in the facts, again, change the outcome. All right, now back to our thing here. Um, they, they're, there's that mere slipperiness rule we would apply and say, no, you, you, you're not liable for this, okay? Um, in addition, we have a couple other things that apply, all right? Now the mere slipperiness rule that I mentioned, that comes from an immunity as well for local governments. I, I mentioned when I started that the used to be the government could do no wrong, right? But that's not the rule anymore. Well, some, uh, some things that the government is immune from or was immune from have been kept and they're in statute. And I mentioned these here, 36603, okay? So the mere slipperiness rule, that applies broadly to, to landowners in general, but it also is, is uh, scooped up into this idea that governments get an immunity for the condition of roads, sidewalks, uh, and places they create and maintain for people to use from just snow and ice accumulation there, okay? As long as they didn't put it there, right? And this is newly formed ice. So, so in this case, this woman slipped on what was probably newly formed ice, something between the time they treated it and she slipped on it. We're not liable for that because it, there's no way you could ever get rid of all of the slippery conditions outside in the winter. And we don't have to, okay? Um, for risk management, what this means is address the snow and ice that you have, simple things, Okay, shovels, snow blowers, uh, you, you have some heavier equipment too sometimes that can certainly help with some of this stuff. Okay, salt, sand, these little things. Let's say they did have a downspout and, and it created a ridge of ice and they've been working at it and trying to get away and they tried to do something. Well, that might mean that, that there's no liability, okay? Because you're trying to do something. It's, it's simple things, it takes a little bit of time to do, but it's what, what we have to do to make sure that your area is safe and you don't face any of these claims, right? Okay. Um, making sure I didn't miss anything here. Okay, so we're gonna move on from here into the next one. This is a little bit different. This is not, uh, this is a slip and fall, but it's inside. This is not snow and ice accumulation from outside. We're inside of a building here. And this was not a case. This was a, uh, this was a um, private event held uh, in a town hall that was rented out, okay? Uh, and Julie, I see a question. I'll, I'll try to come back to your question, okay? A man in his 80s is attending the monthly board meeting at the town hall. He walks with a cane and usually has someone help him walk. Today, his son drops him at the door and doesn't help him in. He, he was carrying a cooler in one hand um, and his cane in the other. There is snow on the ground, but the walkway is shoveled. It's not slippery. He, no one has, has had any issue there. Okay, so we're not talking about a walkway problem. He gets inside the town hall. The floor is wet inside and he slips and falls, of course, okay, sustaining serious injury to his hip. We see a lot of hip injuries. He sues the town for negligence. Is the town liable? Well, we're gonna say probably yes. We might have an, an immunity here, but, but probably yes. So we walk through our steps. Is there a duty? We're inside of a building now right? We're inside of a building. Do you have an obligation to uh, try and prevent people from slipping and falling there? Yeah, you do. Uh, part of this is a matter of foreseeability. When you have wet conditions, let's say it's raining, it's not snowing, all right? So you didn't know uh, uh, that it's not like it's winter where you know people are going to track in wet boots or something. Let's say it's rain. Uh, this comes and goes and, and uh, it's, it's less predictable. Okay. Uh, town hall is rented out. You know somebody's going to be there this Saturday for, as, as this happened to be, a Euchre tournament. And uh, people are going to come in. People are going to go. Part of the expectation here is you know, as people go in and out, they may have water on their feet regardless of the time of year. And so there probably was a duty to prevent this problem. And here, the, the most obvious one that they didn't do was to have a rug, right? Rugs are not all that expensive. Even if you, you get the good commercial ones made for your commercial space, uh, it's a really simple way that will prevent literally hundreds of thousands of dollars of injury to someone, okay? Um, and then here they, they would have breached that duty, right? Now, here's where we get into questions of where I say likely yes. One of the questions is, is, is the water on the floor the legal cause? Okay, did he fall because of the water or was it because he was limited mobility 
using a cane and trying to carry a heavy object on his other side. Uh, he knew he usually needed help or escort, okay? Um, so did his family. Um, there's questions about, well, was he exercising due care? Was he watching where he was going? Was he uh, uh, looking at his phone? Okay. Um, walking while looking at your phone can be dangerous too. We talk about driving, but walking while looking at a phone can be dangerous too. Um, so here we get into questions of what's the legal cause? What, what really happened? Okay. Um, now, in the last issue, last question, we talked about an immunity. We had snow and ice immunity, and it also mentions recreational immunity because that's another immunity that, that local governments get. Here, it is possible that recreational immunity would apply. Okay, so let's say that we, we had a duty, he wasn't looking at anything, uh, uh, the town failed in its duty. So we're gonna say the legal cause is, is the town didn't put down the, the rug, didn't have a mop available. Okay, this was a foreseeable problem, right? You, you know it's gonna get water on it at some times, especially in high traffic. All right, um, do you have an immunity? Well, the recreational immunity says that if you as the local government set out a space that is for the public to use for recreational purposes, that you're immune from uh, some lawsuits that happen because of the condition of those places, All right? Um, this again gets into some difficulty to apply and why I say likely yes, okay? Uh, recreational immunity can apply inside just as much as it can on a playground outside. Um, but it, uh, there's a lot more questions to it, okay? You know it's there, but here's where these last two examples, we use that checklist. Look around at what you have, periodically review them and try and figure out what are the places a person might get injured and what simple things can we do to try and prevent that, right? Now, let's say we had this example, but they had the rug at the door and he slips and falls somewhere else. The facts might be different enough that, that we say, look, um, they didn't know it was there. It was rented out for a private event. They did put rugs at the door where people uh, are likely to accumulate all that water and, and uh, for the, from snow or rain, okay? Um, at a certain point, it might not be the legal cause uh, is the township and, and the condition, okay? But there's lots of things we can think about with this stuff. If you have bad carpet that's pulled up and somebody trips and falls on it, yeah, that's a problem. You have to address that, okay? You have bad railings if you have, uh, even if there are a couple steps with the railings outside or the railings inside the building and they're not in good condition. What if someone grabbed onto that railing, kind of fell and needed it to, to keep themselves up? Are they likely to be able to do that? Okay, so these are some of the things that we ask and, and simple inquiry can help you avoid injuries to people uh, who are using your space, which could include you. Right. I mean, there's a personal interest in, in making these things safe, too. All right. Next section, vehicle collisions. That's a huge area of, of problem um, because uh, there's just so much people are doing with their vehicles. This has always been been an issue. It's a matter of um, we're not always the most attentive and, and working at high speed. And with townships are working with such big equipment that uh, it's limited visibility. Okay, and sometimes hard to know what other people are going to do while you're operating. All right. So here's example one: town graders blading a road. His practice is to take one pass of one lane, then do a second pass for another. The grader begins backing up to turn around. So he's done one pass. Okay, he's done one pass, and he's turning around. And because of where he's at, he needs to do a little bit of backing. He has lights flashing. The sirens are going. The backing sound, you know, the beep beep sound. Right. He's checked his mirrors. He's looked behind him, nothing, okay? He's done everything he could do. Moving very slowly as graders do, he uh, feels something behind the grader. He stops and he walks back behind the grader and finds a small car behind him. You'd be shocked at how often this happens to us, okay? To two townships. The car is damaged, of course, because this massive grader has struck it. Is the town liable? And we go through our, our pieces here, our elements. Did, uh, was there a duty? Yeah, there's a duty not to hit other vehicles. We all know that, okay. Did he fail in the duty? Yeah, he failed. He, he ended up hitting it. But causation, that's the question. So we get to our third piece, causation. Did he know it was there? If he did everything he could, he had all these safety features and he looked and he looked behind him and he checked with mirrors 
Okay, and we're gonna assume he doesn't have a backing camera here. He can't look behind him. Well, what else could he have done? I guess you could get out of the grader, but that doesn't seem like a very uh, good solution to every time you have to back up a little bit, right? So he's done all these things. And here, we would probably say, no, the town is not the, the legal cause of the accident. And, and in a lot of these, it's not. It's because that car gets right up next to that grader for reasons that we can never seem to answer. No matter the hurry they're in, they seem to get right up next to that grader on a big wide open town road. You know, it's not like you're in, in uh, rush hour traffic here. You have space. Yet this person has put their car right there where they can't be seen. So we would probably say, no, we're not paying that claim. That town is not liable. You contributed to this problem. Maybe there's negligence, but it's contributory negligence. And we have to figure out uh, who is actually liable for the accident, okay? In vehicle issues and in property issues, there's something uh, to pay attention to about, did you know of a condition? Did you have a reasonable chance to know about it? So in this greater one, he didn't have a chance to know that somebody was back there, right? Um, with certain snow issues, we can't know at all times what the conditions are there, right? With playground equipment, okay, you have a recreational immunity, yes, but there's kids, you don't want them to get hurt. Um, you can't know the condition of that equipment at all times. You sometimes rely on the periodic reviews or somebody to tell you there's a problem, right? So we're supposed to know what's going on to be able to be, uh, to have to have a duty, right? To have, to have negligence. Um, Greg, likewise, I'll grab your question here after I do the second example. Another one, town uh, snowplow strikes a mailbox while plowing. Mailbox is not a swing or breakaway post, but is an ornate brick structure that violates the mailbox law. Mailbox was visible, driver got too close. Is, he, is the town liable and for how much? Well, so again, very similar to our last one. There's a duty, yes, not to hit stuff. He breached the duty and he just plain, he could see it, he just got too close. This happens. If the person's using a breakaway poster swing arm, the damage is usually not that great and it could be paid for pretty easily, okay? But this brick structure, let's say, okay, that wasn't supposed to be there in the first place. Now we have a bigger question, right? Yeah, you're not supposed to hit it. You did hit it. Are you the legal cause? You're the legal cause of striking it. But are you the legal cause for the amount of damages? That's another thing that now we're getting into. What are the actual damage amounts? Because if they follow the law, there wouldn't be near this amount of damage. And these, these brick structures, I mean, we've seen them, you know, over $1,000 for a mailbox because you hit this thing. Um, this is where we'd say, well, we're maybe liable for some piece of it. We'll give you the cost to replace it with a swing arm that's legal, but we're not going to pay for your obstruction in the right of way. One, it violates the mailbox law, but two, it violates the law that says you can't put obstructions in the right of way, 160.2715, that we use all the time to get rid of things in the right of way, right? So because of these issues, we may be liable, but not for all of it. All right, a couple of questions. Could former board members failure to hold the developer accountable cause a current board to be held accountable for the developments of failing roads? These are still private roads not accepted by the township. This is not a personal injury issue, Julie. This is not that we're not in that box here, okay? Um, it, it's not, and he, here's the distinction, okay? It's not in our box here, but the town takes actions by the board whether it's the old board that was on the board last year, five years ago, 10 years ago, okay, or the new board. You are not a, a group of individuals here operating for the township. And that's why you don't have personal liability, right? The town has liability for things. So we can't look at it this way. If the town took an action, yes, that could be binding in contract or in consequence on a later board because it acted as the township. And now you're just a different group of people acting as the same township, right? So there's an idea of, it's, it's sometimes called privity or um, um, the idea that you stand in the shoes of, of the people that you replaced, right? Let's say you don't like a contract that the prior board made. Well, you're still in contract. You, you can't just breach it because you're a different person there. And this might be the same kind of thing. So I think you have a different issue going on and, and give us a call, we'll address this road issue because it's not quite a personal injury issue, right? Um, 
Greg, would a township be liable for damage caused by materials such as large rocks placed in the town right of way by a property owner? What would be the proper risk management? Okay, good question. Um, so you're not putting the stuff in the right of way, Greg. I'm assuming it's other people are putting the stuff there. And as I just mentioned, it's illegal to do that. And even before that, I said, if you know about a condition, now you have some kind of obligation to do something. So yes, you could be liable and it would be probably a negligence because there's no intentional act here. So it would be negligent failure to remove this harmful condition, right? And there's uh, fortunately, if you know the right of way, what you your right of way with, okay, you, we have laws that protect that right of way. So if they put rocks, they put, you know, that big mailbox, like we said, they put hay bales in there. They put, you know, people put all kinds of crazy stuff in the right of way. They, they abandon cars there, let's say. They're not parking them, they're abandoning them there, okay? You guys have remedies. You can just go move the stuff, just push it back over the right of way, all right? Uh, you can take it and uh, ask the, the folks where they want you to put it, uh, okay? Um, Occasionally you can take it and hold it, but we recommend against that because now you're holding someone else's property. Okay, so it's better to just move it back behind the line. Um, it's better to, to kind of communicate with them if you can, but if they insist on trying to keep it there, you insist on moving it and that's fine because that right of way isn't theirs. They may own the underlying interest, but you have a duty in law to make that, that corridor for transportation safe. Otherwise you do face a negligence problem and they face a negligence problem. Okay. But since it's often the government is deemed to have deeper pockets, um, the town is the one that gets sued. And Sarah, we use a licensed and insured contractor to grade and plow our roads. He carries general and liability insurance. What might be the township's liability above and beyond in case of accident? Excellent example, a uh, question about shifting liability, Sarah. Okay. None of what we're talking about is related to shifting liability, shifting indemnity. But any contract you make with, with contractors, we tell you, you need to get insurance, right? And you should have a contract that says when they do something wrong and it's their wrong, they're paying for it. You may get sued as a township, okay? But in the end, if, if the township is ordered to pay money, they're going to pay you through their insurance. That's the idea, okay? So, and it's because when they're acting for you, there's law that says they're your agent, and so you're supposed to have some kind of control over them. Now, that's not necessarily true with a contractor. That's the point of a contract relationship. You don't have all control over that contractor, right? So we can get into discussions about legal cause. Who's the legal cause of the problem, right? But to just get rid of it, we say, look, you want to work for us? You're going to carry insurance. Of course, you're going to raise your price by the amount of your insurance or some part of it. And if there's a problem, you're going to pay for the wrongs you did. We're not going to pay for your driver negligently striking a vehicle, um, um, uh, harming somebody's water structures, okay? Um, these can be conversion actually, uh, water issues where you, you flood somebody, that can be considered an intentional tort sometimes too, also negligence, so. Uh, but it's a good question and, and it's why we shift, basically shift responsibility or ensure that if we're responsible, they're actually the one paying for it. All right. Um, I think we have time for this one. This is a longer example with bigger consequences. This is a St. Louis County case. Town graders operating in the left lane of a two lane road. Okay, so one, one in each direction, right? And this grader, he's operating in the wrong lane. So he's, you know, he's going in a direction, but he's in the left lane because he's not, that's, that's okay for this, all right? That's what he believes he needs to do to, to grade this road. And they do this to avoid what they call a deadhead pass, meaning a pass where you lift up the blade and you don't do anything, but you go all the way down this stretch of road. Okay, so St. Louis County looks at this and they, they believe it's acceptable. And, and here we're gonna make it a town example. It's been considered by the town board and maintenance staff. It's allowed when needed. It's November, meaning we're getting into winter and early sunset at 444. While grading at about three miles per hour, the operator sees an oncoming car and the car does not slow down. The operator slows, he tries to move right, but of course he's in a grader and he can't, okay? So the car hits the grader, it kills the kid driving. The collision was between sunset and 515. The exact time is disputed. The family sues for negligence and produces a witness who alleges the grader's headlights were not on while it was operating in the left lane. This person, this witness had gone by 
before the grader and the car collided. So sometime between sunset and this accident, this other car had gone by and said the, the headlights weren't on. But undisputed, flashing lights are on uh, all day since the beginning of the shift and it remained on into the evening. So is the town liable here? Okay. Is there a duty? Yeah, there's a duty. Okay, was there a breach of the duty? Here, I guess these are these are what's going to be considered fact issues, and this is where uh, some of these things go to juries to decide. It, they could be a judge, but often a jury decides this kind of stuff. Okay, and and it's because we have disagreements about certain facts r related here. Okay, of course, there's a, a duty not to strike other cars. Okay, and and they struck each other, but one approach could be well. The grader was stopped or virtually stopped. He was trying to avoid this car and the car struck him. Okay, so this car clearly, he, he was operating and didn't look up. He clearly didn't see the, the grader through the stretch of this town road, all right? So we, we have some question about the duty that's involved here, all right? Um, but the bigger question, let's just say there was a duty and, and it was breached. The bigger question is, is there cause? What caused this, this collision? Was it the fact that the grader was operating in the left-hand lane? Or was it the, or was it the, the fact that uh, uh, it didn't have its headlights on even when in the left-hand lane? Or was it that uh, the, um, uh, the kid driving the car didn't apparently look up for quite some time? Uh, I guess assuming that he didn't need to look up, right? And this is more common now with phones, people not paying attention to the road. Okay, so this goes through through courts and what they end up doing is saying we're we don't know we could fight about some of these these fact issues. Okay, so for example, the headlights were they on court interestingly here says doesn't matter doesn't matter if they're on because let's take it as true that the witness saw the greater didn't have headlights. Okay, well that's evidence that the headlights were not on at that time but it's not necessarily evidence that the headlights were not on when the car and the grader collided, okay? So yeah, it, it's, it's evidence that this condition existed before, but it doesn't say that it existed at the time we care about. And I found that a little bit interesting, okay? It's, it's not, uh, it's true. Uh, it's not direct evidence of the conditions at the time of the accident. And that's how the board, or, uh, excuse me, how the, uh, the court kind of dismisses this and says, yeah, we don't care about that. Okay. But what we do get instead is a discussion from the court of two other types of immunity. The first is called statutory immunity. And governments, including towns, are immune from liability. Here's the quote. Any claim based upon the performance or failure to exercise or perform a discretionary function or duty, whether or not discretion is abused. It means that uh, you have a lot of choice in policy level decisions, okay? Um, a discretionary duty is the thing where you have choice as opposed to what's called ministerial. Like the clerk, somebody mentioned in an earlier question, well, that the new treasurer, the old treasurer isn't giving over the checkbook. Well, that's not a discretion that the old clerk or treasurer has. They're, they have a ministerial duty. They must do this job of turning over the books, papers, and, and records of the office. That's a ministerial duty, okay? There was no discretion. But here, the town board considered the policy of, of uh, grading in the wrong lane. And they said, okay, here's the risks, here's the benefits. They made a planning level decision at the board level with their staff and with their managers and it was reflected, okay? That action gave them statutory immunity, okay? It, it's deemed to be discretionary. They could have allowed it and they could have chose not to, to, to pursue that course, okay? They had the choice. And here they also held, look, there's a statute. Maintenance vehicles engaged in work have some exceptions, all right? And then uh, this, is, this is helpful. As a practice, when your township considers things like this, you wanna talk about them and make them uh, uh, make a decision and then reflect it in the minutes and say your reasons. This is, this is really important, okay? Because if they hadn't done that, if they hadn't given their reasons for doing this, they would not have had statutory immunity in this, right? 
we would have ended up with a, with a disputed case where we try to figure out facts and the jury decides, well, who's at fault? We would have fought about causation, okay? The statutory immunity was an excellent shortcut here, okay? Um, I have a couple of questions. Okay, I'll come back to these because these are not related directly to this, this uh, example. We'll get through with this example, all right? In addition, um, this operator, okay? We just talked about a policy level uh, decision, right? Your, your board, you, you guys think about things and you make decisions and that's your job. You get them in the minutes and describe real reasons, okay? It's more efficient, it costs less money, it can, we can do more work in less time. That's all the good reasons that they were doing this practice of grading in the wrong direction. Whether you like it or not, okay, they got to choose, all right? Um, and they set some, some criteria, you know, and then that gets respected. But the other one that they applied, the one that the, that the court applies is what's called official immunity. And this is the individual, the guy operating the truck, okay, the, the grader. It, it means that a person uh, here, a public official charged by law with duties which call for the exercise of judgment or discretion is not personally liable for the exercise of discretion, okay? And, and the hard part is in applying this of what's discretionary and what's uh, ministerial, okay? And there's lots of case law on this stuff. But in this one, they say, look, he had the option. He, he was given this choice by the, by the township. You can use this practice if you want, or you, or you do this direct back thing, you, you don't deadhead, or you could use the process where you take you know, three passes effectively, you deadhead to get the, the shape you want. And he chose one of them, okay? This immunity says that's protected, right? Um, it doesn't apply when, when it's a ministerial duty, okay? Uh, or it's performed negligently as a ministerial duty. Um, or when he purposely does something wrong, like he, he knows it's wrongful and he does it anyway, right? Here, it's a matter of training your employees. Here, here's the menu of options you have in this type of situation, okay? And having them try to decide uh, what they're going to do in each of these situations, okay? So for example, lights. He should have no option about whether he, he used lights. Remember I mentioned the lights were on? That's because it was required by their policy. That's great, okay? That's ministerial then. He doesn't have discretion to turn them off or, or, or not use them, okay? He had to, and that was a factor that advantages the town in a dispute. Well, if the headlights weren't on, well, what about this flashing light? Why didn't the kids see the light, okay? Um, headlights, should there have been discretion in that? Maybe, and that's something you as a, a board would talk about. Do you, do you have headlights on all the time, whether it's needed or not, just to say, yep, you're on, done. You're expected to do it. Or did he have discretion because, well, I use them as soon as I can't see and I need them, right? The old style uh, cars. So um, this is a matter of training and, and giving employees the options available and the reasons why, and then letting them make their decisions, okay? And I'm not gonna go deeply into it, but we also have what's called vicarious official immunity. That's where the town gets the benefit of what this employee chooses, okay? So um, let's say the employee makes a choice that's, that's concerning and, and they have immunity and then the plaintiff says, well, fine, I'm gonna sue the, the township for letting them do it. Well, no, you get protected by vicarious official immunity. Um, immunities are very helpful to local governments. They have to be used carefully. They're never uh, a means to say, we're going to be careless. They are a means to say, we're doing the best we can. We're doing a public good, a public service, and we have limited resources. And it's not like a business where, uh, you know, yeah, it fails and, and that's unfortunate for those business owners. It's terrible, but, um, uh, there are other opportunities there. Uh, with, with immunities, it's, we have a government, this exists for the general population. It serves very different functions for everyone. And we're gonna try and protect that, try and limit how much of the public treasury is taken because of personal injury claims, okay? All right, I'll grab some questions here. Jared, what if the township does not tell them to clear the right of way and the obstruction's been there for years in the case of vehicles, equipment like a bulldozer sitting on the road? Um, 
if you don't tell them and somebody damages their stuff, you're not liable for the bulldozer sitting in the side of the road. So you're not gonna pay for that, okay? Um, now, if somebody hits the bulldozer and is harmed, you are most certainly, with years of time that's sitting there, you are most certainly going to be liable. It is your job as a board member, okay, Jared, I'm assuming you're a supervisor, I'm sorry to tell you, it is your job to help get these things out of the right of way, whether the people who live there like it or not. A bulldozer is going to be a difficult thing to move. Um, they have to be behind the right of way line, okay? And and there's laws to back that up. There's legal process you can use to help with that, okay? Um, there are opportunities to have the uh, person who has that stuff pay the costs. So it is certainly possible to do that, okay? But yes, you guys are certainly in a position of, uh, of risk leaving things in the right of way for that long. Uh, you're not going to be having to pay them for their broken stuff, but you're going to have to pay anybody who is injured by it. Okay. Holly, let me clear a question here. We repeatedly have township residents complaining about a building crew speeding to and from the job site on a town road. It's not posted, so the speed limit's 55. It's small, windy, windy dirt road in the township wants it to 30. Besides telling, okay, this isn't a personal injury question. This is a speed limit question, so hang on, Holly. I'll see if I can grab it after, okay? I'll hang on after, folks, if you have questions not related to our topic. Oh, I'm sorry, the last part is about an accident. Okay, no, you're, you guys aren't liable for speed limits, and that's because you can't set speed limits, Holly. If you guys could set speed limits, you'd certainly be liable for the problems you have with speed limits. This is one reason you are currently not allowed to set speed limits and why it's probably a good idea that you don't get to set speed limits, okay? We can disagree about that. I know some towns are, are adamant that they should get to control the speeds on their roads. Um, setting speeds is a job for a road engineer. It is not a job for an elected town board because uh, there, there are issues we have to deal with there that take a professional and understanding what's at stake at that road. And it's a public safety issue. Um, by not having the discretion, we remove the possibility that you guys have a problem. Okay, so we've got immunity um, and we are right at one o'clock. So we've hit it right on, which is excellent. There's a lot more to learn about this topic. There's a lot of, I mean, this could be a lifetime of study and, and that would be boring for you, I'm sure. But um, what, what we want to take away is, be careful about what you say, slow down with what you say. I know that's hard in the moment, okay? But there's very little that's a hurry in town government and that will help you avoid some of the intentional injuries to people, okay? When it comes to the negligence type of injuries, with any of your facilities, any of your property, you have to use some process to identify problems. And what we're recommending is you use that chart or you find another one to use, okay, if you want. And you make it a point that at some day, each year at least, you go through and you look at the different things you have, whether it's the town hall, whether it's a park, okay? Now, I mentioned immunities, but that doesn't mean you have immunity from everything and anything that happens there, okay? Um, you have to be cautious with this stuff and you do have to pay attention to it. And when you find a problem, we have to try and address it, either fix it, uh, put up some notice that there's a problem and people have to be aware of it, Okay, we have to do something with it. Um, if you have, you probably have a shop, if you have equipment, there's a lot to do with shop safety, all right? Simple things, look at them from time to time uh, or assign someone to go look at them. And, and what we have in the chart is a checklist approach. You don't have to do it all in one day. You could take these and do them quarterly, break them up into different pieces, however you want to accomplish it. But treat it like your road, road review, okay? You guys get in a vehicle and you go look at the roads every year. Why aren't we looking at our property every year? There should be no difference, okay? Um, it's important to do this, all right? So I'm gonna leave our, our discussion on uh, injuries or my, my description of, of injuries there. Uh, if we have any questions, I'll, I'll try to grab questions, okay? Um, but we are, we are at our hour, so I don't wanna take up too, many, uh, too much time for folks here. No questions in the panel. Do we have any raised hands, Kristen? No raised hands. We have, we have, we've been so boring that nobody wants to speak up, which is understandable. Oh, that's okay. So 
Oh, we do have one. All right, Richard. Does the town have any responsibility in issuing a one day gambling permit to any organization? I don't remember. I didn't think they do. Um, why don't you give me a call about that one? I haven't looked at the gambling statute in a very, very long time. Okay. As I have nothing else there, I'm, uh, I'm gonna leave it for the day. Thank you everybody for joining us uh, for day two of supervisor training. We hope you enjoyed it. And uh, remember you can catch any of it online uh, posted later, okay? Um, Jared, no, there's no standard distance in right away. Uh, again, that's a big, big discussion related to right away issues, so. Kristen, go ahead. I'm sorry, you, I, I interrupted you. Um, Jim might want to unmute and comment or ask a question. Sure. Part. Jim, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, Steve, I'm just wondering, do any of these immunities uh, apply to a contractor, like for uh, grading, et cetera? Possibly. There is a case where a, a city engineer wasn't an employee of the city, it was a contract engineer and there was a problem with a, a water management issue based on the design and this was within the last three years uh the i believe it went to the state supreme court and they extended official immunity to the decisions of that uh that contract engineer and then they extended vicarious of uh, official immunity to the township for the decisions and work of that engineer so it is possible okay um from the town perspective, you want to make sure you have that contract that says, that says when they do something wrong, they're at fault. Okay? If you do something wrong, fine, you're at fault. Okay. But if they do, they're at fault and there's insurance to pay for it. That's the important part. And we, they may get immunity later, but we want to rely on the fact that there's money at the end of the line. Jared, you have a question? Oh, yeah. Related to the um the right of way my understanding was basically how far the i was throw the snow kind of covers how far your right of way is is that that's one indicator that can be used for what's called use and maintenance roads or user roads it's the type that's that's not recorded anywhere but you have maintained and open for public use, uh, maintenance has to be any six consecutive years, okay? And one of the things that we would look at to try and figure out how wide do you have is how far the snow is thrown. But there's no standard in, in the state. If you have a formal road, it's 66, okay? But most township roads are not recorded. They're not a standard 66. So what you're looking yeah. at is a good rule of thumb. You only, do work and control the area that you maintain. And snow is one element of that. Yeah, because I, I was just looking at as the liability thing, because we have someone that habitually parks vehicles right against the side of the road. Parking is allowed. Leaves them there. Yeah, <laughs> parking is allowed by default on a town road unless you have a no parking ordinance. Okay, so that's a unlikely to be your problem again, unless it's abandoned and then you may have an issue. Uh, how and that would be the same for like he's leaving bulldozers there so parking i mean yeah. it's not on the road it's in the right of way basically it's against the road um it could be a problem okay if it's an ongoing issue they shouldn't be parking them there long term it's usually transient it's it's stopping for a short time and then moving it, it's not supposed to be a, you use the right, the right of way as a parking area on an ongoing basis, okay? So you yeah. may need to address that with a parking ordinance or telling them, hey, get your stuff out of the right of way because you know, we don't want somebody going by here to hit your vehicle, hit your bulldozer. That thing's not moving, right? There's no gear. Exactly, that's, that's what Somebody's I'm kind of worried about. Yeah, you, you can address that, yeah. Okay, yeah, because he's left stuff there for at least a year, if not longer without moving it. So. Okay, then, then that's, uh, not parking anymore. That's storage. That's something different. So yes, address that. Yep. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Tony has a question. Is there a statute regarding people pushing snow across the township road into the right of way on the edge of the road? So across was, yeah. And that's the statute I mentioned. 120.2715 says you're, you're not supposed to deposit snow or, or ice in the right of way 
or push it across. If it's not causing a problem, you could probably allow it and go, go look at it. Um, if it's like a dead end road and they're pushing it across, you're not going to have traffic issues here. There's probably not anything that's going to come across and, and hit them or harm them. Um, uh, but, but the snow and ice accumulation, if that's causing a problem for your maintenance, yeah, then they need to do something else with it. Okay. Strictly speaking, you could prohibit it, but look at what it's actually doing. Okay. Oh, Steve, acid. Uh, one more on that. Um, sure. Is there a length of time where it becomes abandoned or, or the other not parked? Potentially. You, abandonment is actually really hard to do, true abandonment. So I'd say no on or, abandonment. Or just the not parking one. I forgot what you called it. Oh, do you mean the vehicles? Yeah, vehicles or what have you. Oh, well, uh, no, there isn't a, a, a point in time where you'd say they're abandoned. Um, it, it, chances are they're just parking it there long term. They're just not putting it on their own property. So no, you're not going to probably deal with it by, hey, it's abandoned, let's take it. No, no, no. I, I didn't mean abandon. I just meant sure. they, need, they need to move it from the right away because it's been sitting there for six, yes. eight months, ten you months. Could, you could pursue it with, with just general, okay, you can't leave us something in the right of way for that long. Or you could do an ordinance to say you have this long and that's all. Okay. And then you can. That's what I was wondering, like if there was a, a time as far as the courts go or what have you. Like oh, three months, yeah. six months, what have you. Nothing like that. No, no. I mean, you could do okay. this. Look at look at cities. Parking ordinances. You can't be there more than a day. Okay. So I mean, they, you can make these really short. It's up to you guys sure. what you need. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Connie asks, can we change a stop sign to a yield? Potentially, yes. But again, go back and talk to your road engineer, whether it's a county engineer helping you or a, a, another engineer. These are not things you just mess around with. Okay, there is a ridiculously large manual about signage. Okay, it's not law, uh, it is guidance, but it's persuasive. And so you don't go messing with stuff until you have a professional tell you you should make a change. And if they say no, uh, you get certain advantages and immunities by following what professionals tell you. Follow your professionals. Uh, let me try again. We've been asked to change a stop sign to a yield sign. Oh, okay. You don't have a responsibility to do so. No, that is not a low, that's not a, uh, people don't, you know, I don't like any stop signs or stop lights between me and work, right? I could ask my city to get rid of them, but I, I can't do that. They, they don't have to listen to me. This is not based about any individual. This is based on public safety. So you put the signs where safety uh, uh, demands or, or, or the interests are put them there. Uh, it becomes frozen and the blade operator hits it. I don't know what it is, Tony, I'm sorry. All right, as we are about 10 minutes after, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end us there. Folks who have more questions, please give us a call, give us an email, we're happy to take your questions. That's, that is part of what we do and why we're here to serve you. Uh, so please use us, happy to talk with you folks. So thanks again for joining us today. Thank you, Steve. Thank you everybody else.